want to thank the Rendell Center and the Annenberg Center for making this possible. It's a singular honor for me to be able to talk to so many teachers from around the country and maybe around the world. Uh, this is, of course, the court picture. It's going to change immediately in October. Stephen Breyer will be replaced by a new Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. And as she comes to the court, I have a quandary. Let me describe it to you. Uh, at the end of the term, before the next term, I gather up all my files of notes and I uh, put them in uh, plastic bins so that I know where everything is, so that I'm not looking for some class notes the night before. And uh, I filled up a bin. I was walking to put it in its proper location and realized I was holding the freedom of religion bin. And as I thought about it, I wondered if I just took out most of those folders and shredded them or threw them away, would I miss them? That's how dramatic the change was in what we saw at the end of the term. And I was reminded of an old constitutional law story. Sadly, I know it was Harvard Law. I don't remember which professor did this, but it was the day after Charles Evans Hughes, the Chief Justice, and Owen Roberts switched their votes, the switch in time that saved nine, to save the court after the court packing fight. And this professor walked into his class, filled auditorium, had an armful of every constitutional law book he could hold, walked over to a giant trash bin, dropped them all in the trash, looked at his class and said, now everything's changed. There are no textbooks for us. That's how I feel. So I, I have a sense that we're in our classes, beginning to write a new textbook on constitutional law in the Supreme Court, here's what I suggest as approach. I'm gonna make five main arguments, the last being the conclusion. Argument number one is, I think the new Roberts Court, which I'm gonna call the Alito Thomas Court, because Roberts isn't really in control, I think they no longer care much about hold, upholding precedents or following stare decisis, for precedents that they don't like. Secondly, I think that the meaning of the 14th Amendment due process clause, the substantive due process acts aspect of it has completely changed, dramatically changed. Third, the way that it has changed is that the Alito Thomas slash Roberts Court is using their own version of doing history but it's, the purpose is not to find history. The purpose is to reach the results that they want. Fourth, I'm gonna call this history done by amateurs. Others have done it as well. And the Alito Thomas slash Roberts Court is using this new history, their version of history, to re-rank constitutional rights, to change the levels of scrutiny analysis that I've talked to so many of you about over the years and to create some super rights, but also to eliminate some rights entirely. And finally, because of all of this, I fear that the new Alito Thomas slash Roberts Court will have its independence and legitimacy continue to be under threat. Court reform is coming, I believe, but not soon. Let's begin. By the way, this PowerPoint is, I think, very clear in the argument, and I think it will help you to go through all of this material when you're talking to your class. So as I said, it's been a very eventful six weeks. Let me review it quickly. First, the public approval ranking of the court has cratered. It has plummeted in July. I think it will continue to drop. Just look at the first entry. September of 2020, you see a 66% approval rate and a 33% disapproval rate, a plus of 33 points. Now go all the way to the bottom. This last July, 7.5 to 7.12, 2022, it's completely flipped around. Now it's only 38% approving, 61% disapproving, minus 28 points. That's not a good trend. Next, the public confidence in the Supreme Court has plummeted. 
The earlier poll was from Marquette Law School. This is from the Gallup poll. We saw that trend line down last time that we met. You can see all respondents in 2021 ranked quite a lot or a great deal of public confidence in the court at 36%. It has been cut almost in a third. It's down to 25%. But look at how it's done that. The Republicans percent has gone up by one. The Democrats percent in the last year has dropped by 17. And the independents have dropped by 15. So the support on the Democratic side and the independent side has really dropped for the Supreme Court. Next, you remember we talked about the Martin Quinn scores, ranking where the justices are on the, on the Martin Quinn continuum from negative four, which is most liberal, to positive four, which is most conservative. You see ghosts of RBG and of Scalia there for reference. And you can see that what we saw is a kind of spread array. That was in 2020. Thanks to the excellent research of Professor Lee Epstein of the University of Washington in St. Louis and Adam Liptak's reporting of it, we have now a snapshot of where this court is in 2022. But before I show you that, I want you to focus on where the Chief Justice is. You'll notice that he is right at 0.5 on the scale, positive, and right on his shoulder is uh, Brett Kavanaugh. This is where he is now. He has drifted over past one and grouped around him are the three Trump justices. So Alito and Thomas have really not changed in their position. They're still in the extreme conservative position. Sotomayor has not changed in her position. She's still in the extreme progressive position. Breyer and Kagan are very close in the sort of moderate area of negative one. But you now have the chief who's become more dramatically more conservative to join the three Trump justices. That will become important as we see down the road. Now a new number that we haven't talked about, thanks to the work of Tom Goldstein's excellent uh, um, blog, the SCOTUS blog, S-C-O-T-U-S-B-L-O-G, we have the agreement scores of the justices for the entire last term. These are the number of times that the justices agree with each other. Notice that Roberts and Kavanaugh are basically the same justice. They agree 98% of the time. Notice that there are two blocks of justices. You've got a clear block of six conservative justices who are agreeing with each other more than three quarters of the time, roughly and a very small block of progressive justices that are agreeing with each other more than eight out of 10 times. But I want you to focus just on this Roberts line and notice there's a slight difference there, a curious anomaly that I can't explain right now. Kavanaugh's with Roberts 98% of the time, but Barrett is with Roberts 83% of the time. So she's closer to Roberts than her voting showed this term. Alito is also with Roberts 83% of the time. And I'm betting just a hint that maybe that's not an indication that Alito's moving toward Roberts. Maybe that's an indication that Roberts is moving toward Alito to get into that position where he can pick up the three Trump justices by being past one on the Martin Quinn score. But we're just going to have to watch that a little bit longer and see how that shakes out. Here's another number that we haven't seen from SCOTUS blog. And this is an excellent resource, by the way, the stat pack, statistics pack, which is put out by the SCOTUS blog at the end of every Supreme Court term. This is from their 2021 term, and it's uh, dated 7-1-2022. And what I find interesting there is you have a remarkable amount of agreement between, among Barrett, Kavanaugh, and Roberts. They are voting frequently in the majority. This is just a count of how many times are you in the majority. Now, it makes sense that Roberts would want to be in the majority as many times as he can, because he's the one who will be assigning the opinion then. But the fact that Barrett is hanging pretty closely with Kavanaugh and Roberts may tell us something about the future of the court. It's, it's where Barrett's going to end up. Will she stay where she is voting with the ultra-conservatives? 
or will she move a little bit more toward Roberts and Kavanaugh and create a kind of a 3-3-3 voting array for the court? Here's a thing that I found very interesting. I mentioned Linda Greenhouse's excellent Justice on the Brink book. This was an article that she wrote a couple of weeks ago, July 22, uh, three weeks ago. And she was talking about how she now analyzes the Dobbs case. And apparently the way she prepares for her year analyzing the court is she puts all of the cases that were decided in the past term and puts them into different categories of the issues that they are discussing. And she had the Dobbs case in the abortion listing, but she decided after thinking about it some more that the only way she could explain it, as she said, nothing else explains the Dobbs case, the only way she would explain it is to put it as a religion case. So she moved Dobbs from the abortion listing to the religion case. I found that a very provocative article. And one of the things I do is I have my students read her articles every couple of weeks, analyzing the Supreme Court, because it teaches my students not only about the cases and the issues, but it teaches them how she analyzes the court. They learn a great deal from it. Note the date of this article, July 22. 2022. This was the most surprising thing that I saw in the six weeks. I don't know if any of you read about this. I don't know if any of you saw it, but I urge you to get on YouTube and look for Samuel Alito's speech in Rome to the Notre Dame Law School's Religious Liberty Summit on July 28, 2022. This is just six days after Greenhouse's article was published. And you may have seen a mention of the fact that he was, he was sort of doing like a comedy type of approach. He was criticizing foreign leaders in Europe who didn't like his opinion in the Dobbs case. But the actual speech is on YouTube. And I watched the speech and I read the transcript. And the thing that you need to understand is his audience are, consists of people from the law school at Notre Dame some of whom are reported to be law professors, many of whom do amicus curiae briefs to the Supreme Court in different cases, and Mark Joseph Stern of Slate reviewed their success and discovered that many of these arguments that they present to the Supreme Court, which are in the religion area, are remarkably successful. The court seems to vote with them a lot of the time. You can read the quotation for yourself. This speech is a very strong defense of the free exercise of religion and the need to almost evangelize, proselytize, legally argue for free exercise of religion. I just want to focus on the very last quotation. Our hearts are restless until we rest in God. And therefore, the champions of religious liberty who go out as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves can expect to find hearts that are open to their message. Now, what's interesting about this is you've got a Supreme Court justice who has written the Dobbs opinion, who has voted in all of those religion cases this term, who is appearing before a religious legal advocacy group. And... To the best of my knowledge, and I've been scouring the internet to see anybody else explaining what happened on the term, because usually the justices do that, nobody else has spoken about the term. This is their comment. So my question is, is this one of the new agenda items for the Alito Thomas court? And the secondary question is, is in fact Linda Greenhouse exactly correct? I want us to focus first on the Alito Thomas Court's new stare decisis policy. Let me put up a quote and give you a moment to read them. I think we have our answer. Apparently Samuel Alito does not see precedent as an inexorable command. And apparently Clamence Thomas, who was speaking to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, believes the stare decisis is a mantra for when we don't want to think. What they have done to precedent is remarkable. They basically changed the rules, and that's going to be the theme through this entire speech. It is that the rules are different for this court now. 
when we talk about what a partisan court might look like, as opposed to a political court, as opposed to a neutralist court, these picked up from our last discussion. This is what a partisan court does. What I'm showing you here is a very short bullet type of summary of the plurality opinion of Sandra Day O'Connor, David Souter, and Anthony Kennedy in the Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey abortion case in 1992. You have three justices who, if they were facing Roe and abortion in 1973 for the first time, I'm going to bet there's a pretty high likelihood they would have been in the dissent. They would not have voted to uphold the right of abortion. But this is 19 years later. This is 1992. And the argument that the three of them are making is we're going to uphold our version of Roe. Our version of Roe will not be Blackman's version. It will be a lesser protection of abortion. It will be in the middle, intermediate level of protection. We are not going to use total protection for the right to choose abortion. We are going to use undue burden. If your legislation in some way creates a substantial obstacle for a woman's right to choose, we will overturn that. But we're doing this because we believe in precedent. We believe that if you are going to overturn a precedent, You've got to prove one or more of four different things. you got to show that the precedent that exists isn't workable anymore. It doesn't do what the justices wanted it to do. you got to show that the precedent that exists has not been relied on by people, that it is not something that anybody will miss. And if it's not something that anybody will miss, if it's creating problems, if it's not been relied on, then we can overturn it. You've got to show that the precedent that exists is still timely, that what they saw in that time period for that case still exists, that that, that decision is not an anachronism. If it isn't an anachronism, then the precedent must continue to exist. And or you have to show that the facts of the case that you have now before you are substantially different in an important way from the facts of the case of the precedent that you're using. They do these four things. They look at Roe and they say nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. And what we have is a decision that needs to be upheld, but it needs to be altered. And now it's Sandra Day O'Connor's version of Roe. It's not Harry Blackman's version. How do I know it's not Harry Blackman? Because in dissent is Harry Blackman. And he's saying, hey, this is not the role that I wrote. And one day it will be gone unless you get me some help. And by help, he meant in the 1992 election, get me some progressive justices who will vote like me. He was pressing. This is Samuel Alito's new version of what to do about precedent. Now, I want you to focus first on the bottom, because this is where this test comes from. Those two cases, the Janus case, I know many of you know very well, better than I do. Janus versus State, County, and Municipal Employees Federation, written by Alito. And then Ramos versus Louisiana, that is, should a jury trial be a uh, unanimous verdict? And this is a concurring decision by Kavanaugh. In both of those cases, they decided to overturn the precedent. And in both of those cases, they overturned precedents that were very old, substantially old. I think Abood goes back to 1977 for the question of whether or not if you are a teacher or a union member and you have not paid dues, you're not part of the union, but you are benefiting from what the union does, you still have to pay dues because of their political action. So Alito is picking up on those tests and he's saying, I'm not going to use what they did in Casey. I'm going to use these five factors. Now, if you look at three, four, and five, they look familiar. Workability. Does the precedent has a disruptive effect? Is there an absence of concrete reliance on the precedents? That's basically what they were doing in the plurality opinion in Casey. But the first two are what he is really focusing on. 
I'm going to look at that precedent and I'm going to say, did the court make a mistake? I'm going to look at that precedent in first instance, as though I was on the court in 1973 looking at Roe. What would I have voted? How would I have argued? That's basically what Alito is saying. I'm going to redo that case. That's not part of the standard version of dealing with precedent. And then in doing that, I'm basically going to grade the opinion. I'm going to look at the quality of their reasoning. And if I don't like their reasoning and I don't think they got it right, I'm overturning it. So none of this matters. It's just what does Alito want to do with his precedent? What does Thomas want to do with his precedent? Here is where we are. I'm going to give you a bit of an example. And it's something that I probably, uh, I would urge you to think about doing in your classes at any level, because I think it's something that the students can access easily. And it's something that is a very, very clear in the way they're dealing with precedent. These are six of the roughly 30 or so, and there may be more cases than that, but my research said it was about 29 or 30 opinions by the Supreme Court that dealt with the separation of church and state. Beginning in 1947 with Everson versus New Jersey, the child busing case, can you give a student a nickel to get on a public bus for safety to go to a religious school? Hugo Black has a kind of split ruling. He argues there's a seven point definition of the high wall of separation between church and state. But then he says, but you're trying to help children here and keep them safe. So I'm going to invent the child benefit theory to say that doesn't violate church and state. Now, many of you are familiar with Lemon versus Kurtzman, the Lemon test, the three prong purpose and effect test. We're gonna look at the aid that you are giving to religious schools, and we're gonna ask, does that aid have a secular purpose? And does that aid not advance or inhibit religion? And is there no excessive entanglement between church and state? If there is still a separation between church and state there, we will allow the regulation. You can pay for books for schools, you can't pay for teachers to do the teaching. Now, I focused on the word and because Lemon versus Kurtzman exists much longer than people give it credit for. It was changed by William Rehnquist when he was dealing with the aid to parochial schools cases. And all he did was change the and among the three prongs to or. All you got to do is prove one. Secular purpose or can't advance or inhibit religion or no excessive entanglement. And he would argue that if you have a voucher program, as they did in Cleveland, and the voucher program is picked up by the parent, and it benefits the parent, and if the parent can make a private choice where he or she wants to send their child to school, and they want to send it to a, to a, to a religious school, that's fine with me. All you've got to do to, is prove to me that there is a secular purpose. And legislators are very good at claiming to be a secular law when in fact it's a religious law. Coming from those two precedents, we have the no endorsement test, the no coercion test, the no targeting of religion test, and then this broader case that deals with whether or not you can put too much money into a religious benefit that will hurt the separation of church and state, or can you lock down church and state too much and hurt free exercise of religion? And so William Rehnquist came up with the idea of you have to have a play in the joints. You have to be able to balance out free exercise and the establishment of religion. Again, there are roughly 30 of these cases. You've got all of these precedents. Just look at the picture. See that it's the 50 yard line. The man in blue is Coach Kennedy. If I had a bigger cutting, you would see that there are parents in the stands. This is after the game. And one of the many, many times that he did this was at homecoming. And read the sentence that Neil Gorsuch has offered. That's basically his opinion. That's it. This picture or pictures like it appear in Sotomayor's dissent. I've never seen that happen. 
but all you need is the pictures. And the question is, could a school, Bremerton, say to the coach, we're afraid we're going to get sued. It looks to us like we're violating the lemon test if you are holding prayer meetings with your players and opposing players and opposing coaches and opposing teams' family members on the 50-yard line after our football games. We're going to get sued for a violation of church and state. And then we're going to get sued because it looks like we, the school, are endorsing religion. And what Neil Gorsuch says is, I'm just going with his free exercise of religion because this is a private, personal prayer offered by him while his students are otherwise occupied. If you want to have a great time with your students, all you need to do is look at the first three or four pages of Gorsuch's opinion, the facts of the case, and then give them the three or four pages in the beginning of Sotomayor's opinion, her version of the facts of the case, and let them decide based on that. Because you're asking two questions. Is this private personal prayer by a coach who is funded by the school district and thus by the state? And do those players who are kneeling, are they feeling coerced? Because Gorsuch says they're not coerced at all. So what does he do? You can see in the blue, he abandons the lemon test and he abandons the no endorsement test and says, these tests have been gone for a long time. We're not going to use them. What does he use? He now uses something called the reference to historical practices and understandings. But that reference to historical practices and understandings has to accord with the history and faithfully reflect the understanding of the founding fathers. It's basically his version of originalism. I'm going to do a version of history understandings that I think the founding fathers knew. I'm going to do my version of history. And what am I going to conclude? I'm going to conclude that there was no impermissible coercion here, that this was a private religious exercise that didn't cross any line, and the framers would agree with me. So what is the test? I have no idea. Because every set of facts has to run through Neil Gorsuch. He has to do his version of history. Apparently, no coercion might still be there, but all the other tests are gone. You don't even have to teach them. Just predict what will historian Neil Gorsuch do that will get four other votes. This is history being written by five justices. But the trick is, there are three different historians in three different areas of law who are trying to get the other justices to sign on. So looking for a rule now, there is no rule. But here's the general thread. Free exercise is dominant. Establishment of religion and the separation of church and state, almost non-existent. This is his conclusion. They're punishing an individual for engaging in a brief, quiet, personal religious observance. It's protected by the free exercise and free speech clause. They had a duty to ferret out. They thought, the school district thought they had a duty to ferret out and suppress religious observances, even as they allowed comparable secular speech. But the Constitution neither mandates nor tolerates that kind of discrimination. So you can't do any separation of church and state analysis. You've got to just look at whether or not this is a private prayer. A similar thing happens in Carson versus Macon. This is the Maine tuition case. Maine wants to say to parents who are in school districts that are so rural, they don't even have a high school. If you want to, you can send your child to a neighboring high school. Or if you want to, we will give you, I think it's about $15,000 to pick any school you want. Far as I can understand it, it's not just in Maine. You want to send them to elite prep schools in Massachusetts or Connecticut, feel free. But you can only send them to a secular school. You can only send them to a secular school. So the argument of two sets of parents are we want to send our child to a religious school and we're being discriminated against, we can't send them to a religious school. 
but the secular parents can. Chief Justice Roberts assigned this opinion to himself, and he's trying to argue here that it's important not to discriminate against religious people who want to send their children to religious schools. That what is important here is that the government needs to be neutral between church and state. But Sonia Sotomayor sees something else. She has been writing consistently in all of these cases for five years. I told you that the separation of church and state is being abandoned. And now this court is saying, if you try to separate church and state here by not funding religion, it's a constitutional violation. So essentially she's arguing, you are requiring the state of Maine to do what it does not want to do, to create what Stephen Breyer would call religious strife by giving money to religious parents to send their children to religious schools. She is making it clear that the establishment of religion, the free exercise, the establishment of religion and the separation of church and state, all those tests are gone. All that matters to the majority now is promoting the free exercise of religion. The results of these cases, I think, mean that all that is left of the church and state separation are maybe the no coercion test and Hialeah's no targeting test. That's an interesting one. It's a Florida case in which the Santerians were worshiping animal sacrifice. And it appears that the, the town board decided to ban that after the Santerians moved to Hialeah. And so the court came up with an idea that if you are targeting a certain religious group with your law or your ordinance, that that's a violation of free exercise of religion. And we've got to protect the free exercise of religion and we've got to overturn the ordinance. But the way they are doing this, they are creating what looks like a paramount super right for free exercise of religion. Now, Partly that's very important because it means that states and localities will have no argument to say, I don't want to fund this religious group or any religious group, because apparently that's not going to be an acceptable argument. It's not clear whether the play in the joints idea of balancing out the two sides of the religion clause even exists anymore. The dissents felt that it was gone. But where I see a different and greater problem is the fact that now, if you have a super right that is free exercise of religion, anybody can come in and say, I don't want to do fill in the blank that involves this group of people. Let's make it same sex married couples. I don't want to give them any of my services. I don't want to sell them any of my goods. And I'm claiming my free exercise of religion. So this case is going to balance off my free exercise of religion against some other person's rights. And it's the same group that have been making this free exercise of religion a paramount right that can use it to start wiping out other rights and chipping away at them. I also think that what it's saying is states are going to have to be careful when they fund anything to make sure that they're funding religious groups as well as secular groups, because the trend, you see the Hobby Lobby case, the Trinity Lutheran case, the Espinoza case, the Fulton versus um, City of Philadelphia case, all cases in which there were efforts to, to deal with certain religious groups and not give them financial aid, but all of them had the religious groups winning because this majority was saying, that's what free exercise of religion requires. So precedent apparently is not something that I can rely on in teaching my students and say, let's look at what the past cases were. Now think about this. What do I do now? What I've got to do now is say, this is what the past cases were. But now let's take this issue as an issue like a political scientist. Let's analyze the five or six members of the conservative majority, and let's see individually what are their views on this issue, and let's figure out how they will vote as politicians rather than as judges. Then they'll work their way backwards to, okay, 
Now do we have to overturn the earlier precedent or can we distinguish that precedent away? Or can we find some other way to explain what we're doing? Because that's where I wanna be. I don't wanna be where the precedents are leading me. An example. This is going to be, and I know this is a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit comedic. This is going to be my attempt to explain the 49-year battle of the conservatives on the court to redefine the nature of the substantive due process privacy rights. And the quote for this entire section is going to be Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra is supposed to have said, I'm not sure how much he said of any of the things he's quoted as saying, when you get to the fork in the road, take it. And I'm going to be arguing that there was a fork in the road in 1973. The court took it. And what this court has done is way more than wipe out a woman's right to choose. What this court has done is way more than make it possible for Clarence Thomas in his concurring opinion to say, I think we ought to re-examine all the substantive due process privacy cases that deal with the rights of others and maybe wipe them out too. What it allows this court to do is go back in time to 1973, see where the court went then, and take a different path from there. It is a very dramatic change. It requires a bit of history, but I've tried to make it as clear as I possibly can in the short time that I have with you. I need to talk to you about the 14th Amendment. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This is an excellent quotation from a fine scholar at Richmond Law School who has some very excellent articles. And his concept is re-speaking the Bill of Rights. If you've read Akhil Amar, he has a different way of explaining it, but it's the same idea. There is a big debate among historians of the court, among originalists on the court study, about whether or not the Bill of Rights changed when they were sent through the 14th Amendment due process clause and applied to the states. And the general argument appears to be that the more important interpretation of the Bill of Rights is not in 1791 when they were originally proposed and ratified. It is in 1868 and beyond then when they are being rethought through by the framers of the 14th Amendment. So if it is true that the 14th Amendment due process clause can be used to apply the Bill of Rights to the states, we need to know what was the meaning of those Bill of Rights at that point, 1868 and beyond, rather than 1791. Okay, so why is this important? When we look at the due process clause, as many of you know, due process initially was fairness. All I want to do is look at what they call the settled usages and modes of proceeding. If you want to use a particular technique to garnish somebody's money in order to pay a debt, all you got to do is look at what happened in old England and ask procedurally, was this process fair? It's just looking at fairness. It's looking at procedure. Pretty soon, the justices realized that's not enough. We need more tools. We need to look at the substance of the due process clause. And we have to ask, is it wise? Is this something we want to do, even if it was done procedurally correctly? And so what the justices begin to do is they begin to place rights into the 14th Amendment and enforce those rights. The classic example of it, Lochner versus New York in 1905, the Baker's Hours cases. Bakers are being asked to work 70, 80 hours a week. They are so tired, they are falling into the fire. They are dying. The progressive legislature of New York passes a law signed by the governor that says there is a limit of the number of hours that bakers will have to work, 60 hours. We're going to protect the bakers. We're going to rely on our 10th Amendment right of police powers, the right to protect the health, safety, morals, and public welfare of our citizens. 
Again, procedurally, absolutely correct. But when this case comes to the court, you have a set of justices who are very old, very rich, very Caucasian, very business oriented, and determined to help those oppressed people, the owners of the bakery shop. And so they invent the concept of liberty of contract, try to sell it as the bakers really want to die in the fire and work 70 or 80 hours a week. So we need to protect the baker's liberty of contract. But in fact, we are protecting the owner's liberty of contract. That is Justice Peckham's interpretation. Justice Holmes, in a magnificent short dissent, says, you are simply trying to enact Herbert Spencer's social statics, the idea of economic uh, Darwinianism, and every opinion that you have tends to become a law. Liberty here is being perverted when it is held to prevent the natural outcome of dominant opinion. What is he saying? You are acting like super legislators. You've got five votes. And so you are overturning everything that the New York legislature did. That's not how you run a court. But that is launching the Lochner substantive due process era. And so we see the beginnings of the right of privacy. You know many of these cases. I will just review them briefly and you can look at the slides. Jacobson is the case they talk about for vaccinations now. Can teams of people go through Boston, find people who have not been vaccinated for smallpox and force them to be vaccinated? Now, the right that we're talking about, the substantive due process right, is the right to care for your own body and health in such a way that is best for you. But Holmes says there's an emergency. And so the emergency of the state through the police powers of the 10th Amendment allow the state to force people to get vaccinations to protect everyone. That's Jacobson. Maya, can I allow my child to be taught German by a tutor? Well, there's a law from the World War I period that says you can't. Here, the right that they're talking about is the right to marry and the right to establish your home and bring up children and to worship God. Can the state force a parent not to teach German to his child? The answer is no, because there is no emergency, says McReynolds, and so that right does exist. Compare that right to Pierce versus Society of Sisters. Can I send my child to a religious school? There is a companion case for a military academy. Can I send my child to a military academy? Now we're talking about the right to educate your child and the right of the child to be educated. All of these things are being placed into the 14th Amendment due process clause. And again, the court says that's an emergency situation. That's World War I law. There's no emergency here. Of course, send your children to the school that you want them to go to to be educated the way you want. If you ask Antonin Scalia what he thought of these cases, he would vigorously say, I love them. I love them because I'm going to raise my children the way I want. And that's why he would take his children to Catholic services that were done entirely in Latin. Skinner versus Oklahoma, the three-time loser law. If you're a three-time loser in Oklahoma, you've taken some money to repair a chicken coop and you haven't. You've taken some money to repair an air conditioner system and you haven't. You can be sterilized. William O. Douglas took out a green pen and quickly scribbled on a, on a legal size pad a very quick opinion that argued that the right of marriage and the right of procreation are absolutely protected by the equal protection rights of the 14th Amendment. And then he argued, apparently, you can be a three-time loser if you're a low-level criminal, but you can't be a three-time loser if you're a white-collar embezzler. So clearly, there's a violation of equal protection. We can't allow that. And finally, Prince versus Massachusetts. I love this case because it is from Brockton, Massachusetts, where I once saw my first movie, having grown up in Abington, Massachusetts. 
And there was a woman in 1943 who was taking care of her niece. She was her guardian. And they were passing out leaflets for the Jehovah's Witnesses on the sidewalk that I probably walked on a couple of decades later on. And the argument by the court here is there is a private realm of family life. And there is also a right of custody, care, and nurture of the child that must be protected. We're going to place it into the 14th Amendment. And when we do that, we're going to balance it off against the right of the state to protect the child. And here is one of the interesting cases that the court says, you know what, the right to protect the child is greater than this woman's religion and, protect, and, and possibly the child's religion. And so even though we're recognizing this right to raise the child, we are not going to take away the right of the state to protect that young person. Mix all of this together. <clears throat> Mix it together with the first, third, fourth, fifth, ninth, fourteenth amendments. I'm not done yet. Mix it together with the penumbras having been formed by emanations. The great Raoul Berger once told me that means shadows of shadows. So if I have the shadows of the shadows of these six amendments, plus all the cases I just told you about, I have created a right of privacy that will protect the right of married people to be counseled about and use reproductive uh, 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 materials, non-reproductive materials, birth control, in the privacy of their bedroom. Everything that we see in the privacy area starts here. Griswold. But what I teach my students is you have to understand how it goes all the way back and understand what Douglas is doing with this. Eight years later, Douglas is going to realize he made a mistake, that he left too much possibility for this to be wiped away. And in a companion case to Roe v. Wade called Doe v. Bolton, I urge you to take a look at it and show it to your students. He rewrites the Bill of Rights. He becomes a modern framer. And he says, if I take the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause and add it to the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause and add it to the Ninth Amendment, I can do anything I want in adding substantive due process rights to the Constitution. He even talks about the right to loiter, the right to loiter, that he can walk around in his shepherd's outfit in Yakima, Washington, where he grew up and have people look at him like he is a panhandler, and only his oldest acquaintances knew, no, that's a Supreme Court justice, and those oldest acquaintances, many of them would run across the street to get away from him because they thought he was a communist. That's what Douglas was protecting. All right, now, where does that get us? It gets us to Harry Blackman's difficulty in 1973. How am I going to explain to people where I am finding the woman's right to choose? I could start with Griswold and say, well, Douglas gave this right to married people and it was about reproductive rights. And so I am going to take Griswold and I am going to give women the right to choose to get an abortion. But he felt that would not be enough. And so he did something and I must do this research sometime. I don't know how many times this case has ever been mentioned, but it's not many. It's the Botsford case right in the top. The Constitution does not explicitly mention any right of privacy. And then he talks about a line of decisions going back to Union Pacific Railroad versus Botsford. And he's going to add whatever that right is to Palco versus Connecticut, which was the beginning of the incorporation of the Bill of Rights to the states. So he's gone to Botsford to start this. And he says, he's gonna pick up all the language of Douglas. There are penumbras to the six amendments that Douglas is talking about, but they're all in service of this concept of Botsford. He says that this right of privacy is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision to choose whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. What is Botsford? Botsford is a case that involves a woman who fell out of a 
a, a, a bunk bed on a train and she was severely injured. And she took the case to court and the other side said, we want our doctor to examine her and see how injured she is. She said to the judge, I don't want to have to take off all my clothes to be examined by a stranger. That's basically the lawsuit. Must this woman be forced to get out of all of her clothes so she can be examined by a strange doctor? Horace Gray, who wrote this opinion, is slavishly devoted to precedent, unlike the current members of the court. And he would not do anything unless there was a proper precedent. So this is a very unusual case for him. Knowing that there was not only no precedent to allow him to protect this woman, knowing that in fact there were other precedents that went the other way, there were other reasons why doctors would have to examine a person, Horace Gray said, nope, I'm going to invent the right of every individual to the possession and control of his own person. That's the right that I'm going to put into the 14th Amendment due process clause. That's a version of what Holmes is doing in the Jacobson case. And he said, that right alone protects this woman. And Blackman said, if I take that right, a woman's control and possession over her own body and add it to the Palco versus Connecticut, this has to be a right that's implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. And it is the matrix, the indispensable condition of nearly every other freedom. If I put those two rights together, I have a total right of a woman's right to choose. And his version of the women's right to choose in that first three months was absolutist. It could not be eliminated for any reason. That's the road the court took. From that point on, it's a straight line all the way to same-sex marriage, all of the abortion cases that we have, um, all of the contraception cases that we have now, uh, all of those arguments, same-sex intimacy, the whole version of substantive due process rights begin at Botsford, explained by Blackman. That will help you to understand what Rehnquist was doing in dissent. Rehnquist looked at that and said, I better have a good answer and I better anchor it in the precedence. And so what he does is he uses another case that nobody really used very much. He uses the notion of uh, Snyder versus Massachusetts rooted in the traditions and consciences of our people. This case is an interesting one. It's a guy who knocked over a um, gas station, killed the owner. And in trial, the judge decided that the jury should go and see the gas station. This fellow said, I want to go with you, with my lawyer, to make sure you tell the story correctly. And the judge said, I don't have to do that. Massachusetts doesn't require it. Your lawyer's there. He'll make sure I play this game correctly. So in, in fact, what they do is they go there and the judge gets it wrong. He comes back. The lawyer explains to Mr. Snyder, this is what he was told. The jury was told. And Snyder says, that's wrong. I need to get my right remedy. And so the question is, must Massachusetts allow a defendant to go to the scene of the crime to be able to explain the crime to the jury? And the answer by the court was, you don't have a fundamental right if it's not rooted in the traditions and consciences of our people to be ranked fundamental. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at other states and see whether or not you have an absolute right to be at the scene of the crime when the jury has explained what the, what the, the crime was. And the answer was no. The Snyder case says Rehnquist allows me to become a historian. And so in the second paragraph, what he does is he says in 1868, when the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause was ratified, there were 36 laws banning abortion. 21 of those laws still existed in, 18, in 1973 in Roe v. Wade. And so I'm not going to recognize that right. What I want you to know about this is that four years after that case, the author of that opinion in Snyder, Benjamin Cardozo, reversed his own decision that Palco 
which applies the Bill of Rights to the states if you can find that it's implicit in the concept of border liberty. Palco is an updated reversal of Snyder. I believe Rehnquist knows that, but he has charted the long game for if you follow my method, you can become a historian. And the reason that Cardozo knows he made a mistake is because Owen Roberts beats him in dissent and says, you should be looking at fairness. You should be looking at the decencies and proprieties of civilized life. And so Cardozo changes his mind and he comes up with the implicit in the concept of ordered liberty test. This is Rehnquist's version of Snyder. What he does is he takes Snyder and adds it to Palco. Washington v. Glucksburg is a right of physician assisted death with dignity case. But all you need to know here is Rehnquist didn't want to give this right, and he didn't. And the way that he did not is to use the historical method of Snyder, combine it with Palco, and say no right of physician assisted suicide. This is Alito. Alito's using Rehnquist's test. I'm going to use Snyder and Palco, which makes no sense because one reverses the other. I'm gonna use Snyder and Palco, but I am now going to do that to apply the second amendment to the states. So he's showing the court, the majority, the conservatives, I can pick and choose among the amendments and I can do anything I want with them if I am a historian. Now they become historians. This is the set of rules that you have. Alito uses the phrase history and tradition. Thomas uses the phrase historical traditions in the gun case, ruin. Gorsuch, as you know, uses historical practices and understandings reflecting the understandings of the founding fathers. Scalia had his own version. He would say, I will go back to the original meaning of the framers but I'm gonna follow precedent. I'm a faint hearted originalist. If it's a long-term of precedent, I will follow it. And if necessary, I will ignore everything that I'm doing about originalism to get the result that I want. His quotation is, I'm an originalist. I'm a textualist. I am not a nut. Who was the nut? Some people think he was talking about Thomas. How about that for a quote? Not all history is created equal. I'm not making that up. That's in the Bruin case. All Thomas is saying is, I want to look at the text of the amendment against the Declaration of Independence. And I don't want anything to do with substantive due process. I'm going to use the Privileges or Immunities Clause, which is in the 14th Amendment. The problem is, the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment was eliminated from the 14th Amendment in 1873. So when he tried to do this in the McDonald case, nobody signed on to it. So what Thomas is going to do is his own version of history. These are the rules. You can read them when you get a chance to play with the PowerPoint. Generally, here's his rule. I'm going to use 1868 and I'm not gonna use old English history. He has very set rules about how he is a historian. And he relies more on what was true in the 14th Amendment due process clause ratification period than he does in 1791. He's basically looking for what was the state of the law from 1868 to about 1900. Now think about this, this is a gun regulation. We don't want guns being concealed and carried in, in, in uh, New York. Where else did they do that? Let me think, Tombstone, Arizona. Wasn't the gunfight at the OK Corral about the fact that the Clanton gang shouldn't have had guns because they didn't have badges? And wasn't it about the Earps who did have badges who were trying to take the guns away? Well, what would Thomas do with that, I wondered? Oh. That's an outlier. It's an outlier because it's a territory. And I think he said, because it's Arizona. And I guess maybe it's because it's Tombstone. And every piece of evidence that under, undercuts what he's trying to do to say that there is no historical analogy to what New York has done 
every single one becomes an outlier for him. Breyer has fun with that. So what does he do? What he does is he creates an absolute right for guns, an absolute right for people to carry guns, except maybe in sensitive areas, but apparently sensitive areas are not the entire island of Manhattan. He is elevating the right of the Second Amendment above the strict scrutiny level. How about Alito? Well, Alito, you have to read the dissent by Elena Kagan and Stephen Breyer and Sonia Sotomayor, because there actually is a lot of humor in there. They are stunned by the fact that what Alito does, his philosophy is, you lose, now live with it from last time. All I want to do is prove that the precedent was egregiously wrong. And the way he does that is to survey the history from 1868 until 1900. And he argues that there were no abortion laws in effect that, that allowed abortion. Now, there are laws that deal with the notion of quickening, but they, for him, are also kind of outliers. He doesn't pay much attention to them. And then, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase the dissent from that case, he cross-checks that 14th Amendment history with old, in parentheses, 13th century, exclamation point, English history. He's just basically saying, I don't like the way they did their history. I have a different way of doing it. I'm telling you that this Roe v. Wade was egregiously wrong. I wouldn't have voted for it. I'm overturning it. So what does he end up doing? He wipes out all of those precedents. I believe there are 20 in total. Even though he is taking away a right that was granted 49 years ago in Roe v. Wade, and the only reason he's doing it is because he thinks that the right of abortion is not deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. And he believes that those earlier cases were egregiously wrong. And he tries to argue that Roe and Casey have inflamed debate and deepened division and makes an argument that this will settle things down now because now we've made our ruling. So we'll push it back into the states and let the state legislatures deal with this. Can justices actually analyze history? Apparently not, according to the historians in this country. Joseph Ellis, any professional historian proposing in such an interpretation today would be laughed off the stage. We might call it the immaculate conception theory of jurisprudence. This is law office history, folks. These are lawyers who are cherry picking history and historians, and then law clerks who are cherry picking those briefs to figure out how can we make a, a slanted view of history to get us the results that we want. Of the major founding era historians, all of them listed here, none of them think this is a proper use of history. But the answer that Scalia always gave when he was pushed on this was, maybe so, but I wear the judicial robe. As I knew I would be, I am somewhat behind time. So I have slides on each level of the level of scrutiny. And here's all I want you to see from this. If, if I have successfully persuaded you that what the court did this term was go back to 1973, abandon everything that Douglas and Blackman did, and say to William Rehnquist, we're following your guidance, and now they anoint themselves as historians of the court, and they're going in that direction, this is why they're doing it. I have shown many of you these levels of scrutiny, and some of them, some of you, the original version I showed you were just three, the ones in black. Strict scrutiny, balancing interest, reasonableness. The idea was, if your right is fundamental, the state must show that the regulation on that right is tailored specifically to the interests of the state and it doesn't damage your right. So at the strict scrutiny level, you have to show that your regulation is the only possible way to achieve your goal. That's all there is. And if you have that as your test, the individual almost always wins. The state almost never wins. 
at the bottom, reasonableness or rational basis. There, all you need to, to do is say that a reasonable person or a rational person would agree with your law. I'm going to defer to the legislature. I'm going to allow this, this law to exist, even if it takes that right away. But in the interest is balancing interest, the intermediate level. There, you're balancing out the interest that you have against the need of the state to regulate it, which one is greater. So it's a three-level test. But I have added in other levels. Absolutism. Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. No is capital N, capital O, multiple explanation point, exclamation points. There is no limit on that right. Heightened reasonableness. This is what Kennedy did for same-sex intimacy and marriage. You are going to have the reasonableness test, but I will not allow the state to argue morality. That can't be done under police powers. So even though I'm saying it's reasonableness, I will always vote for the individual. The high intermediate test, this is in the free exercise area. That's Sandra Day O'Connor saying, I'm using compelling state interests, but I'm always going to vote for the state. So the individual's never going to win. And then I want to talk to you about what's happening down below. Below reasonableness, I think, are about two levels. There is a basement level. That is the traditions and consciences test of Rehnquist. Rehnquist is not saying there's no right. Rehnquist is saying, I don't see that right being protected in history. Theoretically, if you show me a majority of the states are going to protect that right, then I will allow you to have that right. But I'm never going to find that to be true. As opposed to the absolute bottom, there is no right whatsoever there. That's where Scalia is. So what does this do? What I want you to see is the larger version of all rights. And I just want you to focus on what's in blue to understand that strict scrutiny is what governs racial minority discrimination and affirmative action. But when you look at women's rights, uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was not able to convince the court to make that a strict scrutiny protected right. So it is under intermediate. However, when Ginsburg and O'Connor were on the court and they were writing opinions for the Virginia Military Institute, they were saying that women's rights were in fact strict scrutiny. When you look at these rights, you can see that that's where the rights were initially. This is where Alito was on same-sex marriage. He was at the subflooring, like Rehnquist, history and tradition level. But in fact, they have changed these rights. For religion rights, you'll notice now the conservatives are all in the absolutism for free exercise of religion. Now, if it's separation of church and state, that's going to be much lower. But they have elevated free exercise of religion to a super right. It's even higher than where the progressives were, which was at strict scrutiny. In the area of gun rights, a important part there is Thomas appears to be the only one who's at absolutism. There are separate opinions by Alito and a separate opinion by Kavanaugh and Roberts. And if you read them carefully, I think what they're saying is, we're not going to go as far as Thomas thinks we're going to go. We're going to still hold to some, some justifications by the state to regulate guns, see what Scalia argued at the end of his Heller opinion, and then let's talk about other types of state laws that aren't may issue. They are shall issue. Automatically, you're going to get a license. So I'm not sure that Thomas has any takers for making gun rights into a super right, but we will see. <clears throat> and then in the abortion area, the big change here is on the right. When you look at the no rights level, look at how many people have joined Scalia, I think, for the right to choose abortion not being a right at all. Now that can change. We'll have to watch and see if Barrett is gonna change. We'll have to watch and see if Gorsuch is gonna change. But right now, Alito's saying there's no right. 
I'm not going to do anything to protect this right because I think that Roe v. Wade was egregiously wrong. I know I am at closing now. Why did this all happen? It's really simple. It's more than just what McConnell and Trump did in the uh, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett appointments. It's more than what McConnell did to Garland. It's that since 1970, 15 of the 20 appointees to the court were by Republican presidents. The only reason it was balanced as long as it was, was that David Souter, who was a Republican, Harry Blackman, who was a Republican, John Paul Stevens, who were Republicans, they left to give their seats to the Democrat in office. That's what kept the court balanced. And so when you look at where we are here, you've got pretty much a liberal domination for the right of abortion in 1973, and now it's completely flipped. That's the answer to what's happened to the court. Where are we next? I think this is gonna to continue to be pitching to the right, but I would urge you all to pay careful attention to what Kavanaugh does. If Kavanaugh stays with Roberts, there is a chance that maybe Roberts, who will be with the conservatives, who as the chief will assign the opinion to himself, or maybe to Kavanaugh, they may be able to pick off some of these cases and prevent the court from going even further to the right. There's a possibility for an enclave, a dual median tipping point judicial vote by Kavanaugh and Roberts to keep the court grounded a little bit. And, and maybe I'm crossing my fingers and just hoping here. I wonder if Barrett is going to watch the backlash that happened all summer long. And if we might not see Barrett be a little bit different next year. It's hard to say where they're going to go, but as the court's public support continues to plummet, as the conversations about the legitimacy of the court and the need for court reform continue to be heard, I wonder if maybe Roberts and one or more of the Trump justices might be able to pull the court back, make some voting deals with the progressive three and maybe hold the court where it is. But maybe it's just a wish. Where do we look? The key case for next term is going to be the independent state legislature's gerrymandering case, Morby Harper in North Carolina. That is the fate of our democracy is going to hinge on that. Can state legislators do whatever they want to gerrymandering, to electoral college counting, all of that? You will be hearing about that all year. The affirmative action case at Harvard and the University of North Carolina is gonna be a very big case as well. And then I wanted to put in 303 Creative versus Alanis. That's gonna be one of those people who have a business, they have a website they do for married couples, but she would not uh, sell her services to a same-sex couple. And this is gonna be the court having another chance to balance off the free exercise of religion and speech against LGBTQ plus uh, rights. It's basically the masterpiece cake shop, but on the internet. That's pretty much what that case is. My apologies for going just a little bit long, but it was, you know, 13th century to now, that's a pretty big ass. Thank you very much. I hope this was clear. I hope you enjoy the PowerPoint. <laughs>